So, um, it had a lot of big themes. There was a lot of minutia in the archaeology of uh, over the thousands of years, but there were a couple of themes, and I want to share the themes that spoke to my heart. And the first theme is Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. Um, I'll do it justice. I'll, I'll go ahead and open it up. It won't take long. But you guys are probably familiar with this verse. When I first discovered it, um, the Lord was teaching me about boasting and about being wise and what was I putting my energy towards. And um, this, this verse really caught my attention and, and I think it speaks to um, what the Lord was showing us in Israel. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Um, after Israel, we went to Europe. Israel was a lot of digging. The riches and the treasures of Israel were actually found not in the big buildings, not in the town of Jerusalem, which was pretty awesome. Tel Aviv was the biggest city. It's, a, it's kind of a normal big city. Most of the sites in, in, um, in Israel are still smaller towns. Um, even if it was a large town, didn't have real big skyscraper kind of buildings. Only Tel Aviv was kind of that way. Israel, I've been told Israel's about the size of, if you go from Twin Falls to Caldwell, or maybe Ontario, and then you go from Twin Falls to Sun Valley. You take that uh, rectangle, and instead of it going east to west, flip it north to south, that's the nation of Israel. <laughs> and we covered it pretty good from top to bottom in two weeks. Uh, we didn't have to travel a lot. We spent half of our time in Jerusalem and kind of took day, day trips out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's in um, more the southern or the central southern portion of Israel. Our first couple of days with the northern port of Israel. Um, not to get into a lot of geography, but I think the, um, the point I'm trying to make is that even in the garden, God's a very humble God. He provides everything for us as human beings and gives us one commandment. And um, Satan comes along and whispers into our hearts that our God isn't after our own good. He's holding back on us. And I think... And then, there, then the God of this world lords it over, creates all this thing, gets our attention. And I think that's kind of what I saw, um, that Israel is a very small, kind of insignificant piece of dirt, but a very important piece of dirt because that's where God chose to come down and intervene in man's dilemma. And we didn't even know we had a dilemma at first, 
many people still don't know that they have a dilemma. But God's um, everlasting love, the first stop that we went to was Joppa. Um, it's modern day Jaffa. In the Bible, it's Jaffa, P, uh, P-H, I believe. Anyhow, um, we know that location from two accounts in the Bible, and there might be more. But the ones I want to draw attention to is in the Old Testament, Jonah. Now, Jonah 1 from 1 through 3 says that Jonah was called by God, and he was called to go to the great city of Nineveh. And we know Nineveh as being not only a great city, a big city, but also a very wicked city. When we think of wicked cities in America, man, there's many of them. I won't say them by name, but we think of, and it's, the Bible says that they didn't know their right hand from their left. How many of us in this society now, the devil's gotten us so confused, we don't know our right hand from our left. We don't know our sexuality. We don't know anything about anything. And yet we're so wise and we're going to create this utopian world. And yet we are so confused. And we are, there's evil in that. There becomes evil when we, just, when we turn away from God and we start creating God in our own image. There's an evilness. And Nineveh was a very evil, wicked city. And God loved them. And God loved them. And we need to love the wicked cities. We need to pray for that, even if he'd send us. But God sent Jonah that didn't want to go to Nineveh. In fact, we know at the end of it, so he didn't want to go there because he knew that God's a loving God, and he didn't feel that Nineveh was worthy of God's love. And he just didn't think that that was a very fair thing, that he had to be there administering God's love when he, all he could see is the terrible things they were doing and how they were hurting mankind and how they, des they really deserved justice. They deserved judgment. And God does judge him eventually, but not in this case. God's love is steadfast. So Joppa was the first place that we visited on our trip. It's the port city just below Tel Aviv, maybe 10 miles. It's a very little town um, to this day. And God sent out, well, Jonah left Joppa to go to Tarshish, which was not where he was headed, and then God, of course, intervened. Um, and that's God's heart to go for the lost. Now, these were unrighteous people. These were wicked people. God loved them. Then, in the New Testament, Acts 9, 36 through 43, we hear the account of Peter um, going to Joppa, and there, let's, let's go there, because I'm, I'm a little fuzzier on that account. I want to get it right. And we are going to, because this was an archaeology tour and we did cover a lot of ground, we're going to cover a lot of ground um, today. And I, I don't want us to lose sight of the big picture, but we are going to cover some scriptures. Um, so keep that in mind if you've got a a way to follow me along, great. Okay, 36. So, now there was, a, there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. We call her a Christian. She was a, a righteous woman. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her up in the upper room. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us, help without delay. She was probably sick. I don't necessarily know if it says, but she, was, she had died by the time Peter got there. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the windows, all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics of 
and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Mm, that's precious. She was a good person, Peter. What can you do? She died. Peter put them outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And then she went and saw Peter. She sat up. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Isn't that neat that they believed in the Lord, not in Peter? And, um, and obviously he did what few men uh, had done. He rose someone from the grave. In this case, a righteous woman that had died with good works and with people that mourned her and wanted her to be back with them. Um, and God wanted that as well. And he stayed in the house in Joppa for many days with one Simon the Tanner. So he was in Joppa after um, doing this miraculous miracle of um, raising um, Dorcas from the dead. And he's hanging out. Um, and then a vision comes to Cornelius, a righteous man, the next chapter. Well, let's just read that one, too. And this is where it gets, this is where we're going to put the two pieces together here. At Caesarea, and that's about 26 miles away. It's north, <clears throat> it's north of Tel Aviv. It was a great city. It's one of Herod's um, seven wonders of the world. There was a miraculous, uh, I mean, not a miraculous, but there was a, a, a very... Um, palatial palace. They had a chariot um, arena. Um, they had um, an amphitheater. It was right on the coast. They had figured out how to make cement and they built, um, they built a little hatchery right there uh, on the port where they'd have their fish. And anyway, it was pretty miraculous the things that they had done at that century. And, and he was one of the centurions. Cornelius was a part of, of that Roman Empire of which Herod was uh, ruling here in, in, um, in, in uh, Israel. And a centurion was known. So at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion who was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. So Cornelius, a Roman, a Gentile, but um, was a devout man of God, gets a vision. He sends people to get Peter. And at the same time, the next day, Peter has the dream about um, uh, the unclean animals and all the animals and the sheep. And he says, you know, rise up and eat. And he says, no, I haven't eaten an unclean animal. And he says, what man, what God has made clean, don't call unclean. And so he was opening Peter's heart. Then the next time, next place, um, the centurion's men arrive the next day and Peter greets him and he takes him back. And, and then he um, preaches the gospel to Cornelius and he's saved. So in Joppa, God reaches out in the Old Testament to the Gentiles and, to, and in the New Testament to the Gentiles. So Joppa was a port city on, on the port. One, he did use the Mediterranean Sea. The other, they stayed on land. But it's interesting that God exported his good news to the world. And it was on an export, it was on a port where, the, where he decided this would be the place where and this was one of the site, the first site that we went to. And Joel was very quick to point out that God's, you know, loves human, all mankind, not just those that follow him, not just those that are born into a certain um, sect or race or whatever, you know, being Jewish. He loves everybody. And... Um, 
And that's really the story of the word of God and that we see that clearly in John 3:16. God so loved the world that he sent us Jesus. And so Joppa was a very neat jumping off point because it really set the tone that God doesn't care if you're the most evil person in the world. Uh, God doesn't really care if you're a, a righteous, uh, pious man. We all need Jesus. And our pious doesn't get us to God. And our evil doesn't prevent us from, from coming to God. It's our heart. So what happened when the evil people heard Jonah after three days in the whale kind of lay it on him pretty thick? I've heard some people say that he was pretty angry. He didn't want to be there in the first place, and he didn't feel that good after three days inside a whale or inside of a great fish. Um, it was... Uh... So anyway, it's about the heart of man. Um, that's first stop. This theme has been coming through. I think I've shared it maybe even with, with Jeff. I've seen Jeff a couple of times since I came back, and... I've shared this with a number of people that one of the things that occurred to me is that God hides in plain sight. Uh, when we look outside and we, we, we behold his creation, when we look at ourselves and we look at anything that he creates, he, his wisdom, his creativity, his awesome attributes are clearly seen and yet some people will say that it happened by chance other people will say no there's a divine creator and he doesn't come in and say okay guys you're right you're wrong he just kind of lets it be and he's very humble in that <clears throat> we get to choose if we want to open our eyes or not. And Jesus said, I didn't come for the, I came for the sick. I didn't come for the people that think they got it together. And at one point he says, if you didn't, if you didn't see, you would see me. Since you see me, you won't see me. And that, that paradox struck me in Israel that they had the Messiah that fulfilled, Jesus came, humbly fulfilled the words, the Old Testament, which the Israelites studied, and yet what was their main complaint of Jesus? It wasn't his works. It was the fact that him being a man claimed himself to be God. And on what, on what authority did he? Well, he did it on the authority of the scriptures, and those, there are many scriptures about the Messiah that would come, the anointed that would come, and he fulfilled them all. Um, many of them were fulfilled in his death, but many of them were fulfilled in his life and his birth. And they were aware of those scriptures, and yet their eyes were closed. One of the more poignant, almost laugh out loud moments in the trip was when we were driving to one of the destinations and we were on the highway and along the highway, you'd have the road signs that say, you know, so many miles to this location. And then on the back side, as you're going the opposite direction, it's blank. And they would, and the, the zealot um, uh, Orthodox Jews have put up a poster of a rabbi and declaring that he was the Messiah. We were in Tel Aviv, and one of the people went to get some cash at the store, and they were handing out pamphlets of another person from another sect of the Israelites that said, no, this is the Messiah. No, this is the Messiah. No, this is the Messiah. And when Jesus came, they judged him because you say you're the Messiah. Yet he filled all the scriptures, and you know we know that the cornerstone that the builders rejected God is, the stone the builders rejected God is used as the cornerstone. So we understand that that was going to happen. But it was so interesting to me when when um, Joel had said these guys are were dead for 20 years. One guy was dead. I don't know how this other one, but 
this one that was on the poster where Joel had um, told us what that was about. He shared, well, this guy was that he didn't he didn't um, fulfill any of the scriptures that I know of. And yet here he is clamoring and they're clamoring that he's the Messiah. Won't it won't be any wonder that the whole nation of Israel will will uh, be deceived by the um, the Antichrist because they are looking even to this day they're they're looking for their Messiah it's sad but it's also wonderful that they their eyes will be open God will open their eyes um, and God is just, and God is love. So understanding God takes a lifetime, doesn't it? It takes a lifetime. It, his, his love is deeper than we think. His, his, I think I'm struck by his humility. I mean, how can God be humble? I looked it up, and I don't think there's any scriptures that speak to it, but certainly... Um, He's mighty, and he's just, but the fact that he's so slow to anger, he's so slow to judge, he lets us choose, that's a humble. My, my wife made a statement a couple of months ago that struck me. She said, if I knew us and I was God, I'm not sure I would create mankind because we're, we're a hot mess. And even when we are saved, we're still a hot mess. Our flesh is kind of unruly. It's kind of a, a rough deal. But God loves us that much that he created us and knew these things before he did anything. And he subjected himself to how can a loving God? That's the next step I want to talk about. Righteousness and judge, judgment. When we were in Israel, we looked at a lot of Sites. They were called tells because they were basically mounds of dirt that had accumulated over the ruins of a, of a town or a, a, a fortress or city. And they were basically hills. And then you would dig the dirt away and you'd find the rubble. And then you'd dig deeper and you would find um, the layers of ruins. And in many cases, um, a lot of these towns had been um, uh, destroyed numerous times. The two most destroyed cities in the world, and I think there's probably a lot more than that, but these, these come across is Megiddo, which is in the valley of, oh, I, I'm not good with the Jewish words, but it's where, it's the valley of uh, Megiddo, where the Armageddon is. Um, and that is a path from the Mediterranean Sea, um, which will take you in inward about 80 miles or so, and then you come south directly to Jerusalem. You can't come directly to Jerusalem um, any other way. The mountains are in the way. But if you come through that valley, then you come down and you follow um, where the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, there's a valley there, and that's, that's the path. And, and Jerusalem is just to the, the west of the Dead Sea, northern Dead Sea. And, and, um, and then you, um, you can... Here, there, and that 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 particular place was a, is a tr strategic location, and it was um, destroyed 32 or 38 times in the 30s, 30 times. The most destroyed city on Earth is, you guessed it, Jerusalem, over a hundred times. A little city over a hundred times. Um, in Jerusalem's case, it was rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt. In some cases, um, the cities that were destroyed were destroyed forever. The first one that comes to mind is Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> we were able to go to Masada, which is across the Dead Sea from Sodom and Gomorrah. The one, and it's close to, to um, Mamre, which is where the account of Sodom and Gomorrah starts. It's actually where Abraham is visited by um, uh, Jesus and two angels, three people, the Lord and two angels. And they come to give him the news that in a year, 
Sarah's going to have a child. And he's in the, he's in the, um, uh, the trees of Mamre. And we, we found the location. It's uh, archaeology. It's in, it's in Joel's book. And uh, there uh, the Lord comes down and provides the, um, the promise that I, Isaac would be born in a year. In a year, and this time, there's going to be a baby crying, and of course, Sarah can't believe it. She's 80-something, and she laughs to herself, and, she, you know, the Lord challenges us are on her disbelief. I'm, yeah, exactly. How many people are, are 80 years old yet? Uh, nobody, and yet, someone that age, God says, you're going to have a child, and she doesn't laugh, of course, and that's crazy. God is so crazy good, and I think he likes it that way, right? He likes us to be completely astounded, and he understands that we are, you know, pretty. Our faith is like a mustard seed, but that's okay. God used it, and he used um, Abraham and, and uh, Sarah's faith. And it was interesting, the next, then was they're leaving, <clears throat> Abraham goes out with them, <clears throat> and they look over Sodom, and they said, should we hold this back from Abraham? He's going to be the father of a great nation. Should we hold back what we're going to do? And they said, there's been a big outcry. The sins are great. And, um, of course, uh, Abraham's nephew, um, Lot, was in, in Sodom. Um, we saw it from Masada. There's a plane right at this point in 2023. It looks like a triangle. I don't know how much of it's receded from the, what it looked like at that time, but there is a, um, a valley there, a plain where they're growing crops. It's not a real big area, but it's certainly there, and it's in the shape of a triangle right on the other side of the Dead Sea. It's on the southern part of the Dead Sea. Masada is at the very far end, um, and that was a great palace that Herod had built. Um, one of his seven. Um, Jesus didn't build any cities, any palaces. He built a kingdom in heaven. So it was interesting to think of the gods of this world and the real God and what their priorities are hiding in plain sight was pretty interesting to see what the priorities of these two you know the kings of this world and the king the king of the universe so anyway we looked over there and the first thing you notice is that in the middle of this triangle of green pastures a strip nothing there and Joel points out to us that's where Sodom was and he has a um uh, a podcast on the sulfur balls that he discovered in the in the um, in the area, and uh, it's a very interesting study. We won't spend any time on it, but I do think the this speaks of the justice, uh, the righteousness of God, and that because sin is so corrupting and is so evil when it is that it it requires um you know mortify the deeds of the flesh how many of us struggle with our flesh and if you don't control your flesh it's going to control you i don't care if you have um a belief in jesus or not if you don't control your flesh uh, it will control you and we have to exercise our will over our flesh um and God knows the destructive nature of sin. And so when he's ready for him to judge, and he doesn't always judge. We saw that in Nineveh. Um, he doesn't always come with judgment. When he does, he means business. And he's very exacting. He didn't take out that whole valley. There's still life on both sides, but where Sodom was and he judged that town, it is it is, there's nothing growing. We didn't go over there. It was in, uh, in Jordan. We didn't have um, 
we were only in Israel. Uh, I think the next trip that Lighthouse takes, they're going to maybe go to Sodom, um, and they'll they'll go into uh, Jordan. And uh, but I can say that from from just across the the uh, the Sea of Gal uh, sea, the Dead Sea, and you can see across it. I don't know how many miles, but um, it could be 30, 40 miles across uh, the Dead Sea. You could see um, Sodom right there in the strip of nothing. Um, another um, place where God judged, and um, it was Hatzor. It's, it's H-A-Z-O-R. Um, it's in the, um, the book of, of uh, Joshua, 11, 1 through 5. He basically commands Joshua to take that city. And Joshua burns Hatzor. Uh, we saw the burn layer. Um, it was very, very interesting. The, the archaeology at all these locations are always line up with the Bible. There's plenty of critics, but um, that's, that's a real blessing to have faith in something that is real. Not a, all, all faiths have that. No other faith has it, actually. Um, every other faith, quite frankly, is man-made. This is not. God came to us. God wrote, gave us his word, and his word is trustworthy, and we saw in the archaeology that the word of God and the archaeology fit together all the time. Um, in Jeremiah 49, verse 30, 33, I want to I go to that, because that's the part that we see today. So Joshua came in, took over the Canaanite city, and they subdued it. There was many opposition. They had gathered his forces as they were coming through. Um, the, Is the Israelites were making a name for themselves, and the Canaanites were afraid, greatly afraid of them, and so they, they kind of gathered together the many of the kings to, to, um, to uh, defend Hatsar, and God gave them into Joshua's hands. Um, later, it's, it's um, going to be judged again, this time a little differently. So we read in Jeremiah, and we know Jeremiah's context, right? Um, we are in the middle of, of a rebellion. The children of Israel have fallen away from God, and God is judging them. He, he'd sent, um, he had sent... Um, uh, Assyria in earlier and took the northern tribes and he's going to send in the um, Babylon to take over the southern tribes. And now concerning uh, Hatsar, he says on verse 30, Okay, flee, wander far away, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Hatsar, declares the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has made a plan against you and formed a purpose against you. Rise up, advance against a nation at ease that dwells securely, declares the Lord, that has no gates or bars and dwells alone. Their camels shall become plunder, their herds of livestock as spoil, I will scatter to every wind those who cut the corners of their hair, and I will bring their calamity from every side of them, declares the Lord. Hatsar will become a haunt of jackals, an everlasting waste, everlasting waste. No man shall dwell there, no man shall sojourn in her. It's a barren wasteland. There's nothing in Hatsar. The ruins go out, there's a, there's a little wheat field out there. There's no, there's towns around Hatsar, but not in Hatsar. There is nothing there. I didn't see any jackals, but I can declare to you, as of two months ago, um, 
There ain't anything in hats are. That was a very humbling thing is when God places a judgment, it is, it is put in stone. It's, it's not going to, no man's going to undo that. There's nothing wrong with that ground, but there's nothing built there. There's many of sites that had foundations on foundations on foundations. Once he declared that to be an everlasting wasteland, it's an everlasting wasteland. That's a humbling thing, to know and understand an everlasting God that loves, but also, when it's time, judges. I think with that, um, it's important for us to think, so you went to Israel, can everybody go to Israel? No. Is that important? No. What's important is that we don't waste the time that we have and that we are bold with our faith because we have the truth and, and we are gracious and kind and that we don't hold it in, that we speak forth. Um, ask God every day what his purpose is for us and he'll show us. It could be the little things, it could be big things, but the time is short. Um, things are ripe for, for the, um, you know, uh, for the tribulation period is coming a hold and God is going to not just judge the world, but he's going to usher in the true kingdom and it's going to be glorious. And we have the privilege of being with him. Let's, let's, you know, make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit and understand even if we don't feel like we know all the Bible and maybe we can't get in a debate with everybody because we don't feel like we can defend the, the uh, God doesn't need to be defended. All you need to have is faith of a mustard seed and keep on track of what you know and, um, and God will God will use you. And I think he wants to use us. He wants to send us out. We can even be Jonah. That's okay. We can be reluctant. If God's going to use you, he's going to use you. It'd be nice if we didn't have to be swallowed up and, and um, go through all that turmoil. But he, he doesn't waste anything. One other thing I thought was interesting from my perspective, Jerusalem, Jerusalem was, um, I mean, Israel... We think of Israel as kind of as a desert. It's really a, a hilly country. Um, there's about 24 inches of rain from Jerusalem north in the north country. That's about half of the ground. Um, they, the agriculture in Israel was surprising to say the least. It was incredible. What was incredible about it is that, first of all, the ground is rocky. There's rock. It's kind of like Buell ground, except it, instead of having sandy silt loam soil, it has clayish soil. So the soil has good water holding capacity, but it's rocky ground. Um, the Sea of Galilee gets rain, and it flows in and flows out, and that's a, a, a big water source. Um, the Israeli people have done a tremendous job of utilizing their, the limited water resources they have. Almost everything is under drip irrigation. I'd say 70%, 60 to 70% of the ground was orchards. Um, um, they grow, they have zone one, so they're growing bananas. They're growing mangoes, they're growing avocados, they're growing almonds, they're growing oranges, they're growing, I think, anything you can think of. I didn't see a peach orchard, um, but lots of citrus. Um, oh, and the dates, 
the, the royal date, the, the palm trees, they looked like royal palm, they're huge. That was for the dates. The dates were the site, they were huge. I don't think as big as some of the accounts, I mean, I don't know if they talked about the dates, but we did see, oh yeah, lots of vineyards, lots of grapes, lots of olives, excuse me, lots of olives. They were farming ground that, in the cities, a piece of, of area this size would have three, or, three rows of olives, and there would be maybe five here, you know, so many feet apart, and they'd have it all nicely. Then they'd have it terraced off so the, the rain would be there. They utilized everything. Um, someone look up Isaiah 27, 6. I'm going to go to Ezekiel. Anyway, I guess I, I won't, we don't have to look it up, but the Bible does speak in those days that he will bring back his people and that he will make the ground bud again and, and they will feed the world with fruit well i don't know i do know that israel feeds europe a lot of their fruit it was amazing how much agriculture came from that 10 20 times the amount of agriculture that we have you know when we put a circle in today if you put a circle of pivot irrigation in um, you have four corners that the circle doesn't cover. That's 15 acres, that's um, 60 acres. The pivot covers 130 acres. So 50% of the ground that we farm, and, and it's very good, very very efficient fertilization, I mean, um, irrigation for um, our side. We have so much land, putting aside 40, 60 acres is not a big deal. Um, but in Israel, they are much more efficient. In fact, I heard that they have more, um, more patents on irrigation than any other uh, nation, and they're the ones that, that basically develop drip irrigation. Um, oh, and the 30 acres, the 30% of the ground that wasn't under orchards, probably 90% of that were under netting. So everything was protected. Um, Lots of, row, lots of um, vegetables and, you know, tomatoes. And they were, um, the, the, the fruit and the vegetation from that country was 20 to 30% bigger than what we normally see. It was, it really was amazing. It really was. I mean, drip irrigation is very efficient. And God bless them. And the scriptures don't, the scriptures, um, there's another testament, uh, and and I, you know, I'm a guy that has an agricultural background, and that it floored me. I think it's the most intensely farmed ground that I've ever seen, more than the Midwest. Um, understanding the Midwest doesn't irrigate; they they get they get it from the rainfall. This is all deliberate and intentional, and very well done, and it is a blessing, and it. And that would, that would be kind of how I'll finish it, is that Israel was an astounding country. It really wasn't... It's where God chose to come down. And, and some people, when you see the Lord's hand, it makes you so appreciative of the love of God. And yet, some people can see it, and they can't see it. So we have to pray that eyes are open and that our hearts are not only open to the word ourselves, but that we're also bold. So I'll, I'll end with that. Lord, thank you for your, your love in your uh, nation of Israel that you poured yourself to the whole world through that small little chunk of dirt. And you come into our hearts, Lord, and now you're living with your Holy Spirit inside of us as we um, acknowledge that Jesus is our Lord. Um, use this um, information, use this burden, Lord, to further your gospel. Help us to be bold and to be gracious and kind and um, to redeem the time for the, the days are evil and the time is short. Uh, bless us as we go into this weekend. 
um, with all the pomp and circumstance of um, the new king of England and, and some of the other festivities, Lord, help us to, to understand that uh, the true king um, dwells, his Holy Spirit dwells inside of us and that uh, we are his ambassadors and that he's coming again. In Jesus' name, amen.